Trying to finish an unfinished room is scary, but it's doable. And I'm going to show you what I did and exactly what it cost. In my case, it was the attic over the garage that sat dormant for almost 11 years, unfinished. Actually, one of the four walls was drywalled, but the other three walls, the ceiling and the floor, were all unfinished. Being over the garage and next to the washer and dryer, I went for the extra thick drywall for sound protection, but it was really heavy moving and I don't think I would recommend it. I would recommend a drywall lift. They were great for not just the ceiling drywall, but the walls as well. I used it pretty much everywhere in the room. It was easy to disassemble and get upstairs and then reassemble. I recommend you have a sharpie or something to write on the walls with because there's a lot of math that needs to be done as you go along. I ended up doing the drywall taping, mudding and sanding and priming myself and I really enjoyed that. That was probably my favorite part. Per my local code I had to install this fire door for access to the remaining attic. I did a lot of research on the hardwood and ended up going with a floating floor. I'd never done it before and like with any wood floor they recommend you take out all the wood from all the boxes and randomize for the color variations as well as let it acclimate to the environment. Another thing I highly recommend is these little plastic spacers that you use when you're installing the floor. It keeps it just about a quarter inch from the sheetrock so that the floor is not right up against the wall as it expands and contracts over the humidity cycles. And they're temporary. You remove them before putting the trim in. Now these are what they call trim screws. I had high hopes for them. The idea is that you can screw in trim and it gives a really nice look and you would avoid having to buy a trim nailer which is kind of an expensive one use tool. I used them here in the threshold but in the rest of the room I found they didn't always go in as far as they needed to and they were hard to adjust after the fact so I ended up buying the trim nailer gun and I think the results come out really nice. And to avoid buying a miter saw, I used these colonial corner blocks so the trim could be cut at 90 degrees, but then ended up buying a miter saw to do that exact cut on the quarter round molding, and I'm glad I did. As everything was coming together, I finally applied the paint and threw up a curtain, and we get to see what it looks like in the end here. So this is the finished room. And I'm still really happy with how the floating floor came out. I really love it and it wasn't a ton of work. And I installed this cool floating bookshelf which gives a kind of an illusion of the books being suspended right against the wall just for something different. And I got one of the bargain basement LED light strips for the back of my computer desk and uh, can light it up at night and it gives a nice atmospheric ambient light. Now a we'll look at the costs. Basically here's the line item for everything I was able to record and I've broken it up into different types of costs and I'll show you that in a minute. So this just gives you an idea there was more going into this than I thought on the outside of doing it. And that's something to plan for no matter what kind of renovation you're going to do. And here's those same costs bucketed by what type they were. So there was demo and cleanup, code compliance, then material and tools. Material was most of the cost as you'd probably expect. And here I tried to make myself feel better having spent so much money and separated the cost into single use for this project and reusable. Reusable would really be like a tool that was purchased for this job that I could use on other jobs and things of that nature. But it's not all about the savings in the end. It was really about the satisfaction of being able to get this job done and get it done myself.